Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to our online class. And uh, we'll be talking about the structure of solids. Um, so as you know, materials differ from one another because of the differences in their properties. Differences in properties of various materials are due to the differences in their structure. So different materials possess different structures. The structure of material exhibits its internal and surface details. And these details can be examined and expressed in different orders of magnification varying from a few times to several thousands. Okay, so our learning objective for this class, let me start by, we should be able to name the atomic model commonly used. Describe the quantum mechanical model that relates to electron energies and briefly describe ionic, covalent, metallic, hydrogen, and van der Waals bonds. And note which materials exhibit each of these bonding types. So familiar naman kayo sa mga bondings, no? Mga bonding energies, right? So in order for, um, in order of, uh, of decreasing magnification, the structure of a solid material can be expressed in terms of the atomic structure, um, the crystal structure, the microstructure, and macrostructure. Okay, so let's proceed to the next slide here. Again, so as mentioned earlier, so different materials exhibit different properties. Okay, so what's the major reason for this? Or for these differences. Yeah, in a way, the atoms or molecules inside the materials interact with each other. Okay, all solid materials consist of a large number of particles called molecules. So these molecules are, are which are bound together to, to form the bulk material. And each molecule is further composed of tiny particles called the atoms. And individual properties of atoms and their arrangement in the molecule determine the properties of the materials. Okay, so therefore to understand the properties and structure of materials, it is necessary to start with the structure and characteristics of the individual atoms. Okay, so we have what we call the quantum theory or the wave particle duality model. Okay, are you familiar with this theory? So this is the most accepted structural model for of the electron. Pero sa electronics, the bing ginagamit natin is the Bohr model to actually describe the electrical properties of um, each material in electronics. So it says here, in this model, the electron sometimes behaves like a wave and sometimes behave like a particle, but do not behave both particles and wave at the same time. Okay, for example, um, electron behaves like a particle if you touch an object. If you can feel, um, uh, if you can feel the material since it's a particle, or you can feel the material since it's a particle, the electron becomes wave-like if used on the operation of the cathode ray or CRT, the sa mga TVs. Okay, so now let's start by showing you this video. Okay, so I hope you will learn something from this video. This is very uh, a good explanation about particles and waves. One of the most amazing facts in physics is this. Everything in the universe, from light to electrons to atoms, behaves like both a particle and a wave at the same time. All of the other weird stuff you might have heard about quantum physics, Schrodinger's cat, God playing dice, spooky action at a distance, all of it follows directly from the fact that everything has both particle and wave nature. This might sound crazy. If you look around, you'll see waves in water and particles of rock, and they're nothing alike. So why would you think to combine them? Physicists didn't just decide to mash these things together out of nowhere. Rather, they were led to the dual nature of the universe through a process of small steps, 
fitting together lots of bits of evidence, like pieces in a puzzle. The first person to seriously suggest the dual nature of light was Albert Einstein in 1905, but he was picking up an earlier idea from Max Planck. Planck explained the colors of light emitted by hot objects, like the filament in a light bulb, but to do it, he needed a desperate trick. He said the object was made up of oscillators that could only emit light in discrete chunks, units of energy that depend on the frequency of the light. Planck was never really happy with this, but Einstein picked it up and ran with it. He applied Planck's idea to light itself, saying that light, which everybody knew was a wave, is really a stream of photons, each with a discrete amount of energy. Einstein himself called this the only truly revolutionary thing he did, but it explains the way light shining on a metal surface knocks loose electrons. Even people who hated the idea had to agree that it works brilliantly. The next puzzle piece came from Ernest Rutherford in England. In 1909, Ernest Marsden and Hans Geiger, working for Rutherford, shot alpha particles at gold atoms and were stunned to find that some bounced straight backwards. This showed that most of the mass of the atom is concentrated in a tiny nucleus. The cartoon atom you learn in grade school with electrons orbiting like a miniature solar system, that's Rutherford's. There's one little problem with Rutherford's atom. It can't work. Classical physics tells us that an electron whipping around in a circle emits light, and we use this all the time to generate radio waves and x-rays. Rutherford's atom should spray x-rays in all directions for a brief instant before the electron spirals in to crash into the nucleus. But Niels Bohr, a Danish theoretical physicist working with Rutherford, pointed out that atoms obviously exist, so maybe the rules of physics needed to change. Bohr proposed that an electron in certain special orbits doesn't emit any light at all. Atoms absorb and emit light only when electrons change orbits, and the frequency of the light depends on the energy difference in just the way Planck and Einstein introduced. Bohr's atom fixes Rutherford's problem and explains why atoms emit only very specific colors of light. Each element has its own special orbits and thus its own unique set of frequencies. The Bohr model has one tiny problem. There's no reason for those orbits to be special. But Louis de Broglie, a French PhD student, brought everything full circle. He pointed out that if light, which everyone knew is a wave, behaves like a particle, maybe the electron, which everyone knew is a particle, behaves like a wave. And if electrons are waves, it's easy to explain Bohr's rule for picking out the special orbits. Once you have the idea that electrons behave like waves, you can go look for it. And within a few years, scientists in the US and UK had observed wave behavior from electrons. These days, we have a wonderfully clear demonstration of this, shooting single electrons at a barrier with slits cut in it. Each electron is detected at a specific place at a specific time, like a particle. But when you repeat the experiment many times, all the individual electrons trace out a pattern of stripes, characteristic of wave behavior. The idea that particles behave like waves and vice versa is one of the strangest and most powerful in physics. Richard Feynman famously said that this illustrates the central mystery of quantum mechanics. Everything else follows from this, like pieces of a puzzle falling into place. Okay, so thank you sa video na to from Ted Ed. Okay, so lessons worth sharing. So what can you say about the video? Very clear, di ba, yung pagkaka-explain niya about the particles and waves? May tanong ba kayo? Okay. Any clarifications? You were able to um, to refresh yourselves diba? about uh, a moving particle has wave properties associated with it. Okay, thus, a moving electron is associated with a wavelength given by yung nabanggit kanina, si De, Bro, De Broly, nakalimut ako yung pagpronounce nun, De Broly equation for the wavelength, which is um, yung Planck's constant Planck's constant divided by the, the mass times the velocity of the electron. Okay, so 
Yung nakita ko na yun sa video, di ba, supports this idea, implication of wave particle duality. Since electrons sometimes behave in a wave-like property, we can only determine the most probable position an electron can be at a given time. Okay, so take a look at this illustration here. This is a comparison of the Bohr atom and the wave mechanical atom models in terms of the electron distribution. Okay, so letter A is the Bohr atom and B, this illustration is a wave mechanical. Okay, implication of wave particle duality. So you have here the orbiting electron and uh, this uh, is a distance from the nucleus comparing it to this model, yung so wave mechanical. Okay, now let's move on to the atomic bonding in solids. So, bonding forces and energy. So when two isolated atoms are at a distant proximity with each other, attractive forces will pull each other together. Okay, however, at very close proximity, repulsive force will be the dominant force that will keep each other apart. Diba yung idea dun sa atomic structure na inexplain din ni Bohr. Alam ko to, uh, familiar kayo dito. Diba yung electrons, diba, orbiting around the nucleus uh, because of the force of attraction, yung mas malapit na electrons dun sa nucleus. Attracted siya dun, diba? So, I mean, hindi niya kayang kumap. Parang sa idea lang natin sa ano, sa yung tutunan niya sa electronics, yung sa intro about the atomic structure. Electro na mas malapit dun sa nucleus. Um, attracted siya dun sa, I mean, ano, malakas yung, ano, malakas yung kanyang uh, attraction towards the nucleus. Kasi nga, di ba, electron is a negatively charged particle and the nucleus is composed uh, or is made up of the uh, protons and neutrons, di ba? Uh, protons, eh, protons is a particle, is a positively charged particle and neutron is um, uncharged. Okay, so yung nasa outermost part ng mga electrons, so recall lang natin, so those are valence electrons. And um, they are loosely bound dun sa atom. Ibig sabihin, since malayo siya dun sa mismong nucleus, so pwede siyang kumawala. So pag may in-apply ka na external energy dun sa mismong atom, so pwede uh, maging free electron yung valence electron. Okay, so mag-iba na yung magkakaroon siya ng effect dun so, sa material mo. So maaring yung material mo, like in terms of electronics, pag naging free electron na siya, so kaya niyang mag-conduct o maging conduct ng current, right? Na-recall niyo ba yung ganang idea sa electronics? So may, may force of yung, di ba, unlike charges, attract, like charges, repel. Okay, so same idea. Now, um, shown here in this figure is the dependence of repulsive, okay, repulsive, attractive, and net forces on interatomic separation for two isolated atoms. So as you can see, you have here the resultant force. And uh, this one, um, this graph actually shows the force against the distance. Now, um, from a classical physics, the total resultant force is the sum of all the forces acting on the particle. Okay, pakitandaan nyo to. So like in this equation, Yan. The resultant force is equal to the repulsive plus the attractive forces, okay? So therefore, at the state of equilibrium, the resultant force is zero, okay? Any question so far? Now we go to the bonding energy. So on topic natin, a reminder lang, this is about the structure of solids. Because we're talking about, you know, engineering materials. So you need to understand the basics. Now, energy required to separate two atoms to an infinite or very long distance. So this is what you call the bonding energy. So this is dependent on the type of atomic bond that the atoms have. And the third um, idea here is this implies that high bonding energies 
have high melting point or high temperature. And uh, that solid substances are formed if there is high bonding energy. So please take note of this. And gaseous state is favored for low bonding energy. So in terms of the bonding energy, yung solid substances um, are formed if there is high bonding energy. And yung gaseous state naman for low bonding energy. Now we have three primary interatomic bonds. I know you're familiar with these three. We have ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds. Okay, now let's um, go over to the first one, ionic bonding. A type of chemical bond formed through an electrostatic attraction between two oppositely charged ions. Okay, negative and positive. So ionic bonds are formed between a cation, which is usually a metal, and an anion, which is usually a non-metal. So yeah, sabi nga, two oppositely charged ions. Now, diba, an ion and cation, diba, ano yan? Positive and negative yan. Atoms of a metallic element easily give up their valence electrons to the non-metallic atoms. Okay? In the process, diba yung negatively charged attracted to the positive, diba? In the process, all the atoms acquire... Excuse me, natching ako. <laughs> In the process, all the atoms acquire stable or inert gas configurations and they become ions. Ano pala yung ions, guys? Anyone? Naintindihan na ba yung ionic bonding? It's a type of chemical bond. Now, take a look at this one. Ionic bond formed between Na is, ano yung Na na element? Sodium, okay, and Cl. Hello, may kausap ba ako? Chloride, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sodium chloride ions from NaCl. Okay. So, mas maganda pa na natin tong video na to to further explain this one. Okay. So, again, thanks to Ted Ed for this video, How Atoms Bond. Ready? Here's the video. Please watch. Most atoms don't ride solo. Instead, they bond with other atoms. Now, bonds can form between atoms of the same element or atoms of different elements. You've probably imagined bonding as a tug of war. If one atom is really strong, it can pull one or more electrons off another atom. Then you end up with one negatively charged ion and one positively charged ion. And the attraction between these opposite charges is called an ionic bond. This is the kind of sharing where you just give away your toy to someone else and then never get it back. Table salt, sodium chloride, is held together by ionic bonds. Every atom of sodium gives up one electron to every atom of chlorine. Ions are formed, and those ions arrange themselves in a 3D grid called a lattice, in which every sodium ion is bonded to six chloride ions, and every chloride ion is bonded to six sodium ions. The chlorine atoms never give the sodium atoms their electrons back. Now, these transactions aren't always so cut and dried. If one atom doesn't completely overwhelm the other, they can actually share each other's electrons. This is like a potluck, where you and a friend each bring a dish, and then both of you share both dishes. Each atom is attracted to the shared electrons in between them, and this attraction is called a co Ano yan? <laughs> Covalent bond. So, na-discuss na dito yung covalent bond. Okay, let's continue. Covalent bond. The proteins and DNA in our bodies, for example, are held together largely by these covalent bonds. Some atoms can covalently bond with just one other atom, others with many more. The number of other atoms one atom can bond with depends on how its electrons are arranged. So, how are electrons arranged? Every atom of a pure, unbonded element is electrically neutral because it contains the same number of protons in the nucleus as it does electrons around the nucleus. And not all of those electrons are available for bonding. Only the outermost electrons, the ones in orbitals furthest from the nucleus, the ones with the most energy, only those participate in bonding. By the way, this applies to ionic bonding too. Remember sodium chloride? Well, the electron that sodium loses... 
lang before we continue. So alam niyo pa kung paano malalaman yung atomic number ng mismong element? Ano yung basis natin for knowing the atomic number? Hello? Recall niyo pa? Yung number of? Hello, are you there? Nabanggit kanina, di ba? Yung pair. Yes? The number of protons, right? Like yung hydrogen atom. Anong atomic number ng hydrogen? Hello, nahiya ba kayo? Sige, let's continue watching the video. So, konti na lang naman. ...is the one furthest from its nucleus. And the orbital that electron occupies when it goes over to chlorine is also the one furthest from its nucleus. But back to covalent bonding. Carbon has four electrons that are free to bond. Nitrogen has three, oxygen two. So carbon is likely to form four bonds, nitrogen three and oxygen two. Hydrogen only has one electron, so it can only form one bond. In some special cases, atoms can form more bonds than you'd expect, but they'd better have a really good reason to do so or things tend to fly apart. Groups of atoms that share electrons covalently with each other are called molecules. They can be small. For example, every molecule of oxygen gas is made up of just two oxygen atoms bonded to each other. Or they can be really, really big. Human chromosome 13 is just two molecules, but each one has over 37 billion atoms. And this neighborhood, this city of atoms is held together by the humble chemical bond. Okay, so there you go. Any questions? Clear naman? Right? So na explaining covalent bond and the ionic bond. Now let's go to... Yeah. So nabanggit na rin kanina yung covalent bonding. It's the sharing of electrons between two atoms. So two atoms that are covalently bonded will each contribute at least okay, one electron to the bond and the shared electrons may be considered to belong to both the atom, both atoms. Okay, so sharing of electrons is covalent bonding. Okay, so this is just similar to what you have just seen in the video, a schematic representation of covalent, covalent bonding in a molecule of, this is methane, okay? So you have um, this illustration of bonding hydrogen and carbon. The shared electron is this one here, shown here. Okay, so now let's go to the third um, interatomic bonds, which is the metal metallic bond. Okay, bond existing in metals wherein the electrons are freely roaming on the metal. So just like in conductors, right? conduct, good conductors, or metals are good conductors, right? Conductor of, anong ibig sabihin, anong sinasabi conductor of electricity, ba? Since the electrons are freely roaming, the electrons can be stated as electron clouds inside the materials. So, yun yung parang idea sa metallic bond, okay? Electrons there are freely roaming on the metal. Okay, clear? Now let's um, look at this one. This is a metallic bonding showing electron clouds. Okay, so these are ion cores, positive and then negative. This is C of valence electrons, in the negative sign and dito. So these are ion cores. roam around lang yung mga electrons dyan. Okay, now we have the second uh, secondary bond. Okay, kung meron tayong primary bonds, yung ionic, um, covalent, and uh, the metallic bond. So we have the secondary bond or van der Waals. So this exists in every atoms and molecules. Okay, due to interaction between poles, yung positive and negative of the molecules. Okay, so this van der Waals happens. Okay, hydrogen bond exists for molecules with 
hydrogen atoms. Okay. Now, ito na illustrate tayo dun kanina tungkol dun sa mga atoms. Diba? You have the hydrogen and the chlorine here. This is the secondary bonding of Van der Waal or Van der Waals bonding. This figure um, shows the schematic representation of polar hydrogen. Okay, oh, it's positive, negative. Okay, polar hydrogen chloride molecule. The hydrogen parts may be considered the positive, while the chlorine side denotes the negative part. Okay, so hydrogen and chlorine. Now, the hydrogen from the right molecule okay, is attracted to fluorine from the left, okay, creating the hydrogen bonding between two molecules uh, during the, this bond or bonding, hydrogen bonding. So what are the effects of bonds to properties? Okay, so we have here some items to um, illustrate or to give us an idea about the effects of bonds. Now, the first one here is diamond have covalent bonds which are very stable. Okay, this is the reason why diamonds are very hard to fracture, diba? Very strong siya na, uh, material, yung diamond. Metals, the second one, are good conductors of electricity. So as I mentioned earlier, yan, lahat ng mga elements na metals are good conductors. Yan. And uh, conductors of ele electricity and heat because the electrons can freely move from one atom to another. Diba? May cloud of electrons dun. In contrast, ionic and covalent bonded materials are insulators. Okay, so because anong, anong, because they lack they lack free electrons or freely moving electrons. That's why they are insulators because they lack free electrons. <clears throat> okay, so now you have uh, refresh yourselves with you know the effects of bonds to properties. Yeah, the metallic bonding. What happens to uh, ano po nangyayari sa diamond? Bakit siya sobrang, ano, sobrang hard na material para ma-fracture? Okay, so here we have the knowledge application. Volume expansion of water upon freezing. Okay. Um, so this figure shows the arrangement of water molecules. Okay, so the first here, nasa taas, a solid ice. So take a look at the arrangement here of the molecules. Letter B is the liquid water. Nag-form siya, di ba? Di ba solid ice nga siya? So in solid ice, the oxygen molecule can combine with two other hydrogens or hydrogen atoms from nearby water molecule. This forms a structure that is less dense than that of liquid water wherein there is less structure those molecules can pack can pack more together isipin niyo lang diba parang unique yung mismong water diba kasi kapag naging solid siya sabi nga less dense siya so uh, nagfo-float right do you follow guys okay isipin niyo lang to diba um usually mga solid diba uh, kapag, uh, di ba, ano ba yung density ulit? Ano yung formula ng density? Density is equal to mass mass over volume mass over volume, right? So usually yung mga solid na mga material mataas ang density nila, di ba, kapag nilagay mo sa tubig, di ba, nagsisink sila, right? No? Nagsisink. Mas mataas yung density nila compared to sa water. Right. Pero itong, itong water, kapag naging ice siya, yeah, nagpo-float siya. So, yun yung parang unique na, na unusual na thing na nangyayari. So, pag nag-freeze yung water. Okay? Like yung idea dun sa, ano, sa ibang bansa, di ba kapag uh, 
winter, 'di ba? Nag nagyelo, 'di ba? Nag nagiging ice yung mga lakes, 'di ba? Or part ng our body of water. Pero sa ilalim actually, yung nasa ano, upper uh, nasa pinaka surface, 'di ba? Nagyelo siya. Nagfo-float pero sa ilalim ano pa rin siya? Liquid siya. Right? So meron pa rin mga species doon na nabubuhay sa ilalim. So although solid yung nasa surface na part. So yun yung ano, yun yung parang amazing thing about, you know, the water. Okay? Pag solid kasi, um very tightly packed 'di ba yung mismong ano molecules doon. Pero here as you can see, um in this illustration, this one is the solid ice and this one is uh, the molecules in a liquid water. Now, to better um, help you understand this theory, so let me show you another video. Okay. May tanong ba kayo? Or may gusto kayong sabihin? Wala naman? Wala naman na, sir. <laughs> sure ka, kararating mo lang. <laughs> anyway, so let's go to this. Let's watch this video. Okay, so I think this is the last part. Water is the liquid of life. We drink it, we bathe in it, we farm, cook, and clean with it. It's the most abundant molecule in our bodies. In fact, every life form we know of would die without it. But most importantly, without water, we wouldn't have iced tea. Mmm, iced tea. Why do these ice cubes float? If these were cubes of solid argon in a cup of liquid argon, they would sink. And the same goes for most other substances. But solid water, aka ice, is somehow less dense than liquid water. How's that possible? You already know that every water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom. Let's look at a few of the molecules in a drop of water. And let's say the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. The molecules are bending, stretching, spinning, and moving through space. Now, let's lower the temperature, which will reduce the amount of kinetic energy each of these molecules has. So they'll bend, stretch, spin, and move less. And that means that on average, they'll take up less space. Now you'd think that as the liquid water starts to freeze, the molecules would just pack together more and more closely. But that's not what happens. Water has a special kind of interaction between molecules that most other substances don't have, and it's called a hydrogen bond. Now remember that in a covalent bond, two electrons are shared, usually unequally, between atoms. In a hydrogen bond, a hydrogen atom is shared, also unequally, between atoms. One hydrogen bond looks like this. Two look like this. Here's three, and four, and five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I could go on. In a single drop of water, hydrogen bonds form extended networks between hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions of molecules. And these bonds are constantly breaking and reforming. Now back to our water as it cools down. Above four degrees Celsius, the kinetic energy of the water molecules keeps their interactions with each other short. Hydrogen bonds form and break like high school relationships. That is to say, quickly. <laughs> but below four degrees, the kinetic energy of the water molecules starts to fall below the energy of the hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds form much more frequently than they break, and beautiful structures start to emerge from the chaos. This is what solid water, ice, looks like on the molecular level. Notice that the ordered hexagonal structure is less dense than the disordered structure of liquid water. And you know that if an object is less dense than the fluid it's in, it will float. So ice floats on water. So what? Well, let's consider a world without floating ice. The coldest part of the ocean would be the pitch black ocean floor, once frozen, always frozen. Forget lobster rolls, since crustaceans would lose their habitats, or sushi, since kelp forests wouldn't grow. What would Canadian kids do in winter without pond hockey or ice fishing? And forget James Cameron's Oscar, because the Titanic totally would have made it. Say goodbye to the white polar ice caps reflecting sunlight that would otherwise bake the planet. In fact, forget the oceans as we know them, which at over 70% of the Earth's surface area regulate the atmosphere of the whole planet. But worst of all, 
there would be no iced tea. Mm. Iced tea. Okay. <laughs> Kamusta kayo? Ang ganda ng video, no? Ang galing ng pagkaka-explain. Anyway, so that's it for today. So, any questions, guys? So, we have presented the, yeah, briefly, the structure of solids. Uh, as you know naman, diba, materials differ from one another. Right? Because of their what? Different or differences in their properties. Okay. Hello. It's anana. It's discussion time or it's time for questions or if you don't have any questions. We'll have a short break and uh, after mga 5 or 10 minutes we'll go back and let's have a very um enjoyable and fun activity okay okay po sir